Okay. A very good evening uh, to you all, uh, dear brothers uh, and sisters in Christ. We thank our Lord uh, and our Savior Jesus Christ for giving it another opportunity to discuss about His uh, wonderful words of life. So today we're going to study about uh, the important things of the, you see, tabernacle. We all know that uh, when the people of uh, Israel were uh, in the wilderness, uh, God gave them the uh, worship uh, in the tabernacle. In the tabernacle construction was completely revealed to Moses uh, in a vision on the mount. And God uh, had told that all things has to be uh, particularly and clearly done as per the God's instructions. Uh, and there has to be no uh, deviations uh, uh, among it uh, and even if there is a law, small uh, deviation also uh, the penalty would be death so the tabernacle construction was uh, particularly monitored by uh, Moses himself uh, and uh, he did uh, exactly as the uh, Lord had uh, commanded him so first of all um, uh, before going uh, through the details of the tabernacle uh, why God had made it, uh, what is the purpose of it, uh, we need to understand uh, what was the real uh, intention of giving the tabernacle. See, tabernacle, why did God give such arrangement? Because some of the arrangements, uh, what we see here is almost uh, similar like what uh, other uh, religious uh, people do, like uh, sacrifice, uh, burn the incense, uh, uh, you see, and uh, turn on the candle, all these things and all. So, why did God give the tabernacle? You see, because God had given them the law. And uh, what is the purpose of the law? What was the benefit of the law? If you see, the law had uh, so much of uh, power that if any man kept the law, he could have lived by the law without uh, facing any death. That is given to us in Galatians 3.12. Can anybody read with Galatians 3.12? And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth it, them shall live in them. See, the man that doeth uh, them shall live by them. So, what was actually told that uh, law had so much of power that uh, if anybody kept the law, he could live by the law. And... Uh, Death was not a possible for him. But why did not the people of Israel keep the law? Because the law was meant for a perfect man. As all the Jewish people and the rest of mankind were sinners in God's sight, they could never keep the perfect law. So hence, law was a failure. But yet... God made a provision in such a way that whenever the Jewish people wanted to keep the law, wanted to try to keep the law, they could have done it by keeping uh, the law. And how was it possible? That possibility only God made by forgiving their entire sins. You see, the entire sins of Israel for one year was totally forgiven when the sacrifices in the atonement day was made. So what happened? That gave them the opportunity to again keep the law. You see, for one more year. So that is the reason God made this provision of the tabernacle where the people could come and approach the priest and the high priest offer sacrifices to God and thus obtain forgiveness of God and uh, try to keep the law again and again. But in spite of all these arrangements, dear brethren, you see, the law failed. So, today we are going to see a uh, little bit of the uh, tabernacle arrangement and what lesson we have in that one. See, the construction about the tabernacle is given in Exodus 25th chapter to 27th chapter. So after this class, you can please go through those uh, chapters. You will come to the clear understanding of it. So it's a, uh, performance. What all uh, sacrifices they used to give? 
what all offerings they used to give, what all things they used to do in the tabernacle, all this uh, is given in Exodus 35th chapter to Exodus 40 chapter. So after the class, you can please read it and you'll get the complete information. So basically, this tabernacle was 150 feet length and his breadth was 75 feet. And this was called as a coat. See, the first thing that you get in the tabernacle was the coat. The coat's length was 150 feet length and the breadth was 75 feet. And inside this coat was called as the tabernacle proper. In the KGB Bible, you see this place is called as the tabernacle proper. And this was 45 feet in length, 15 feet in breadth, and 15 feet in height. And this uh, tabernacle proper was divided into two parts. One, uh, you see, the holy, other the most holy. See, the most holy was a perfect cuboid. You see? It was uh, 15 feet in length, uh, 15 feet in breadth, and 15 feet in height. That was the most of the perfect cuboid, you see. While the holy was 30 feet in length, you see, and uh, 15 feet height, and 15 feet width. So, what type of material did God use in the construction of the tabernacle? If you see, God used acacia word. Or in some translations, in some places, written as a, a sitim, you see, a tree also. So, anyway, both are one and the same. This word was used in the construction of the tabernacle. They used to make wooden pillars and wooden planks and upon this wooden pillars you see they used to uh, put golden plates now why did not uh, god make it uh, the pillars of complete gold why did he just use uh, the wooden blocks or the wooden pillars and then you see a paste it with uh, steel, uh, sorry, golden plates. Why? Because the specific gravity of gold is much higher compared to all the metals in the world. Now, what does it mean by of the specific gravity? You see, if you take uh, a 10 gram uh, gold in your hand and if you, uh, you know, like for example, 100 gram gold uh, biscuit in your hand and uh, on the other hand, if you have a 100 gram iron, you see, a biscuit or a, a piece in your hand, the gravitational pull of gold is much higher than the iron. So compared to all the metals, the gravitation pull of gold is very, very high. Therefore, the tabernacle arrangement which God had given to Israel was a temporary setup. Every now and then they had to remove it and move it to a different place. And the place they were moving was a desert, a lot of sand, and they had to particularly carry up on the bullock cart as per the instructions of God. So imagine such huge golden pillars. Was supposed to be carried to different different places and each and every now and then dismantle it and again construct it was a very heavy task and uh, because of this gravitational pull god knew that uh, uh, taking uh, such a heavy gold was uh, not uh, reasonable therefore god told use the wooden blocks or the wooden uh, pillars and upon that one you put uh, you see, golden plates. That was very easy for the, you see, transportation in the wilderness. Now, who was the construction made? You see, you can see here, the each and every pillars were 
placed uh, side by side and below it they were uh, you see uh, plugs uh, where you can insert uh, these pillars uh, inside the silver chapters you see these types of uh, silver chapters okay the base was uh, completely buried in the ground and once it was buried the golden pillars were locked inside uh, this uh, you see sockets and after uh, you see uh, placing all the uh, pillars uh, there used to be a golden rod that was inserted between these pillars so because of this one there was a very very you see a good advantage that the, uh, the walls of the tabernacle would never shake uh, because of wind or anything it was stand still so it was like a locking system you see you can see in the video also the base uh, uh, that is called as in the bible as the silver chapters okay so those uh, you see the sockets like thing the chapters uh, upon it uh, you see these uh, golden bars were actually placed uh, next to each other and uh, this type of golden rods uh, were uh, actually inserted uh, you see inside uh, this uh, bars uh, so that uh, <clears throat> it might uh, never shake so <clears throat> this uh, uh, holy and the most holy was uh, parted uh, by you see four pillars again uh, these pillars were made with uh, gold and uh, silver chapters but uh, at the entrance uh, you see there was uh, four uh, not four five pillars uh, and uh, the base was made of uh, copper and uh, there was a veil that was separating the holy and the most holy place and this veil was made of special uh, you see cloths uh, and thread this was uh, made uh, with uh, three types of uh, thread blue scarlet and purple upon a white linen cloth you see the design of cherubs uh, were made and uh, this veil was placed uh, at the entrance of the holy and also at the entrance of the most holy that was called as the first veil and the second veil respectively so after this uh, tabernacle was constructed it was covered with four different uh, layers of uh, you see skin and the cloth why because uh, it was to be protected with the uh, you see rain and harsh weather also so therefore it was like a you see a tent uh, almost building like a tent and covering it with a, a very you see a uh, very tough uh, tarpaulin like thing so there was actually a particular materials also we are going to study god willing in the future coming classes so uh, there was a coat and a covering now how was the coat constructed you see the coat which was surrounding the tabernacle around 50 feet uh, length coat it was you see covered with a white linen cloth and these uh, linen cloths were placed uh, upon the wooden pillars see you see in the holy and the most holy everything was made out of gold but here the outside the coat uh, was made out of uh, wooden pillars uh, and it is to have you see copper uh, base and uh, silver uh, chapters and again they were tied to the ground with uh, silver uh, strings you see and uh, <clears throat> there was also a gate for the tabernacle so how many gate was there if you see there was only one gate and the design of the gate again the cloth of the gate was same as it was for the first veil and the second veil and uh, very far from this uh, tabernacle was the israel's camp with the people of israel dwelt so none of the people of israel were allowed to come near the tabernacle you see and uh, if they come near or if they jump and see the penalty was death okay <clears throat> now 
let us go inside and see what are the things that are there inside the tabernacle. So as soon as you come inside the gate, the first thing that comes to you, the first thing you can see is the brazen altar. This brazen altar was again made out of wood, cassia wood, and it was four and a half feet by seven and a half feet, you see, and it was again plated with pure brass. That is the reason it was called as a brazen altar made out of brass. Upon this altar, the priest used to sacrifice all the sacrifices, the bulls and the goats, everything. So, after this brazen altar, if you go a little bit further to the, you see, the holy place, there was a lever. That lever was made out of 100% pure copper. And uh, always uh, water used to be placed uh, in the laver. The priest, uh, after sacrificing, he used to cleanse himself uh, of all the, you see, uh, blood and everything and all, you see, with uh, the water from the laver. And uh, he had a small jug, you see, where he could take the water from the laver to cleanse himself. Uh. So, as you come further, we have the holy place. So, once if you go into the uh, holy place, you see, uh, you have uh, uh, three important uh, things in the holy place. That is, uh, you see, uh, the gold candlestick, the table of the shoe bread. And upon the table of the shoe bread, they used to place a handful of, uh, um, uh, you see, uh, they used to place a handful of uh, incense, uh, incense that was particularly and uh, um, you see prepared uh, only for the purpose of placing it in the tabernacle, and no one was supposed to duplicate it. And this uh, table of the shoe bread was again made out of wood and uh, covered with. Uh, you see, golden complete plates. And upon this, there were six and six loaves of bread that were placed. And this was replaced every Sabbath day. And I had the opposite to it. And the very opposite to it, there was a golden candlestick. This golden candlestick was made, uh, you see, out of uh, uh, pure gold. There was no wood used in it. Complete solid gold was made and it had seven lamps. The priest, whenever he used to come inside uh, uh, the tabernacle, you see, he used to uh, cleanse this uh, lamps and pour oil. Okay. So every morning and evening he was doing that one. And it was his duty to see that the light uh, doesn't go off. And uh, between those two, these two items, and uh, very close to the second veil, was the golden incense altar. Upon this one only, whenever the priest came inside the holy place, he used to take the incense that was there on the bread, the uh, table of the shoe bread, and put incense. And that fragrance, uh, you see, that uh, smoke got behind the second veil and entered into the most holy. Okay. And uh, in the most holy, there was only one item that was found that was called as the Ark of the Covenant. This Ark of the Covenant, you see, again, the base was called, uh, you see, the Ark. Uh, the Ark was made out of wood and covered with gold. There was only three things that were available inside, you see, this uh, uh, Ark, you see. And there was a table, uh, 10, uh, two tables where the 10 covenants was given, and the Aaron's butter rod and a golden pot in which there was a mana. Uh, about this one is given in Hebrews 9 chapter 4 to 5. And anybody can read it. But before that one, I want to make a request. See, I think probably the Zoom might disconnect now. Even if it gets disconnect, I request everybody to kindly log into the same ID immediately. Okay, we'll start it. In case if it gets disconnect, request nobody to exit permanently, but rejoin with the same ID. Okay, please. 
can somebody read hebrews 9 chapter verse 4 and 5 which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid round about with gold wherein was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded and the tables of the covenant and over it the cher cherubims of glory shadowing the mercy seat of which we cannot now speak particularly uh -huh. about which we cannot speak uh, now particularly so this is the only verse which tells what was there inside the ark of the covenant it's not given anywhere in the old testament the only reference to it is is given in the new testament where apostle paul clearly tells what was inside the ark of the covenant so upon this ark of the covenant was the mercy seat so in entire tabernacle especially in the most holy place this was the only item that was made out of pure solid gold apart from the golden candlestick so this was uh, carved out of pure gold it was designed in such a way that uh, there were two cherubs you see facing each other seeing uh, the mercy seat and almost ready to fly so such type of design of a cherub was made this was the mercy seat upon this mercy seat only on the day of the atonement the high priest is to come only once a year with a blood of bulls and goats okay now what lesson do we have what lesson do we have in this uh, is there any spiritual lessons for us yes we all know we all have studied type and anti-type you see all the things written in the old testament are written for what what lesson do we have can anybody tell me what lesson do we have of the things written in the old testament do we have any lesson or not hmm? anybody sunita star joel brother munaster romister roshan brother is there any lesson in the things written in the Old Testament or not? Yes. Yes, brother. Yes, yes, we have. Isn't it? So we have studied about type and anti-type. You see, life of Abraham, Isaac, Rebecca. So similarly, even in the tabernacle setup, there's a lot of things written for us. So let us read Hebrews 8 chapter verses 1 to 5. Hebrews 8 chapter verses 1 to 5. Kindly, can somebody read? Sunita Ashtar or uh, Munna Ashtar, anybody can read? Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the psalm. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a uh, minister of the century and of the true tabernacle with the Lord beast and not man. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and uh, sacrifices, wherefore it is, it is of necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer, offer for if he were on earth, he should not be priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law, who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was uh, admonished uh, of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern suit to thee in the mountain. Mount. Thank you, sir. So, here it says, see, huh? uh, as Moses was admonished of God, when he is about to make the tabernacle, said, behold, you make everything what I have said. Because this was all the reflection of the things which are in heaven. Not literally heaven, these things are there. 
but uh, this was got a heavenly meaning a spiritual meaning read colossians 2:17 joel brother can you read colossians 2:17 which are a shadow of things to come but the body is of christ very good which are a shadow of things to come but the body is of christ very good brother thank you now read hebrews 10:1 hebrews 10:1 uh, sunita sir anil brother can you read for the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continu continually make the commerce there unto perfect mm -hmm. see for the law having a shadow of good things to come it was a shadow of good things to come you see it was not a real image uh, so real image was in christ so let us see what lesson we have now from the tabernacle okay see if you observe here uh, the things uh, which are uh, made of the holy place and the most holy place were all of pure gold but the things which are made in the court was made out of copper and brass now, what does this represent what are these two types of metal represent? Uh, you see the gold uh, and uh, you see brass. Uh, the gold. So gold in the Bible always uh, represents the divine nature. Why? If you see among all the metals, the precious of all the metals is gold. We know that uh, its uh, price is also, you see, very high. So in the Bible, always gold represents the nature which God himself is having, the divine nature. Then what does the brass or copper represent in the Bible? If you see brass or copper in the Bible always represents the perfect human nature. How? You see, gold and uh, brass are almost similar, almost the same to look, but it is not the one and the same. You see, so similarly, God created man in his own image. You see, in, uh, in his image, man was created. So, the brass is much similar to gold. Like for example, you see, people nowadays wear uh, uh, rolled gold items, the minute of brass. How is it? It is almost uh, similar like gold but it is not gold that is called as rolled gold so similarly brass and copper is in the image of gold so man was again created in the image of god so these two metals in the tabernacle represents the two salvations one is a heavenly salvation other is a earthly salvation so there are always two salvations so please Keep these things in mind. Now, apart from this tabernacle, very far off, there was a camp. You see? And what does the camp represent? The camp was very far from the tabernacle. So that represents the world. The world who has no contact with God, who cannot come to God, which they are very far from God. So that represents the world. Like for example, in uh, your Nepal, you know, where is the city? Where is the uh, outskirts? Or, uh, you see, suburban. So the urban and the suburban, you see the rural. So that's how you see the camp, which is uh, very far, that represents uh, the world who doesn't have contact uh, with God. But if they need to come and go inside uh, the tabernacle, first of all, they need to pass beyond the court and that court was a seven feet height and it was made out of white linen cloth now what is the meaning of white linen cloth in the bible what does it represents the white linen cloth in the bible always represents the robe of righteousness or the righteousness which we get by believing in the blood of jesus christ read revelation 19:8. Revelation 19.8 uh, Anil, brother, can you read? Revelation 
and uh, gopal brother can you please uh, call sister sunita i think uh, she has got exited okay anil brother can you read anil brother you are there online okay romeister can you read revelation 198 Roman sister, you there? Yes, I'm here. Sister, can you read, sir? Romans, uh, sorry, Revelation nineteen eight. Nineteen eight. And to her was the uh, granted that she she should be uh, arrayed arrayed in fine li uh, linen, uh, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saint. very good sir so the white linen is actually the righteousness of the saints so how do we get righteous you see that is by the blood of jesus christ hence this white linen cloth which surrounded the tabernacle that represents the wall of faith if you need to come to god you need to cross this wall of faith you see in the robe, where the robe of righteousness and then only can we approach god so how do we enter this tabernacle if you see there was one gate through which we could enter the tabernacle and that one gate what does it represent that represents our lord and savior jesus christ so who is the mediator between god and man it is man christ jesus we don't have any much mediators multiple mediators if you need to go to god we need to go only through jesus he is the only gate what does the bible say in acts 412 neither is there salvation in any other but there is no other name given under heaven whereby man can be saved than the name of jesus christ so jesus is the only way to approach god Now what did jesus say huh? he said no i am the true gate read john 10:9 John ten nine, Muna sister, can you read John ten nine? I am the door by me. If any man enter in, in he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. Uh mm huh. -hmm. I am the door. He is the only door, dear brethren. There is no other door. Uh huh. So Jesus who is the only door. So through him only we need to go. Huh? What did Jesus say? I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. You see, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So if we need to go to God, we need to go only through Jesus Christ. Therefore, you see, huh? as soon as we enter this gate, the first thing that comes to our sight is the big brazen altar, seven feet. big brazen altar now what does this represents this was the place where all the sacrifices was given now who is the sacrifice through which we are able to go to god if you see that only one sacrifice is our lord jesus christ john the baptist saying jesus said no john 129 what did he say behold the lamb of god that take it away the sins of the world behold the lamb of god so jesus is the only lamb that take the sins of the entire world so that brazen altar represents the sacrifice of jesus the ransom sacrifice of jesus so jesus died not only for us not only for christians but he died for the entire world read first timothy 4:10 1 timothy 4:10 sunita sister can you read first timothy 4:10 sunita sir are you able to read for therefore we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living god who is the savior of all men especially of those that believe very good sir so especially of those that believe especially of those who believe you see that doesn't mean that he is not died for unbelievers he is died for everybody you see jesus is the savior of all men that is what that uh, brazen altar like, represents uh, You see, that represents the sacrifice which Jesus gave for the entire mankind through Adam. Okay. Now, after you pass this uh, 
brazen altar, the immediately thing we get is that the labor. Labor, what is there? It was made of pure copper. So water was there. Now, what does the water represent in the Bible? So water in the Bible represents the word of God. You see, whenever the priest used to wash his hands, he could see his face clearly. So which is the one that reflects our character, which clearly shows how we are and actually how we should be. It is the word of God that reflects actually what we are. It tells us how we are and how we need to grow day by day into the likeness of Christ. So this is our mirror. That is God's words. So we need to cleanse daily by these God's words. Read Ephesians 5.26. Ephesians 5.26. Ephesians 5.26. Can somebody read? Uh, read brother Joel, brother. That it might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Very good, brother. So, washing of water by the word. So, water means what? God's word, sir. So, we do wash it thoroughly by God's word, sir. It's again mentioned in 2 Corinthians 3.18 and James 1st chapter 22 to 25. Okay. So, this represents the word of God. And there was a small jug that was given for his support to take the water from the big uh, lever. So what does this, this represent? Sir? This represents the supporting materials like this Bible class, the notes which we send, the YouTube links. So daily, these things encourage us to cleanse ourselves from all the filthiness. You see, this helps us to understand more. This helps us to dig more from the God's words. Uh -huh. So, this is what the labor represents. So, if you go further, you see, what is there? The holy is there. But, uh, you see, holy, not everybody were allowed. You see, the levies, the Levites were allowed only till the court. But who could go inside the holy and the most holy? Inside the holy, only the priest could go. Only the sacrificing priest could go. So, what does this represent? Sir? You see, dear brethren, and moreover, the priest, uh, you could not uh, simply open the veil like this one, like uh, how you open the uh, door curtain and go. No, the veil was almost five inches thick. It was not an easy veil, five inches thick veil, imagine. That means it was almost like a bed. So you need to lift it up, you see, bow down and go inside the, you see, the holy place. Uh, that's the reason. Uh, what happened when Jesus said, you know, I remember no? the veil from top to bottom it was open. Why it was open from top to bottom? Because it should have opened from bottom to top. Uh, the Pharisees and Sadducees would have blamed the disciples that they would have cut this veil. But God showed his path to heavenly salvation through Jesus Christ. So what does this represent? Uh? This represents uh, our consecration to God. You see, let us read Hebrews 10.20. Hebrews 10.20. Can anybody read Hebrews 10.20? And uh, can somebody open your Bibles to Luke 14, 26 to 27? Munna sister, can you read Hebrews 10.20? Uh, and uh, Joel brother, can you read Luke 14, 26 to 27? Do you have uh, your Bibles with you? Yes, brother. Hmm. Hebrews 10.20 By a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil that is to say his flesh. Mm, that is to say his flesh. The veil that represents uh, Jesus' flesh uh, through which we have access to the heavenly throne. Okay. Now read Luke 14, chapter 26 to 27, brother. If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sister, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. He cannot and be my disciple. Ah, uh, uh, please. Not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Aha. Uh -huh. Whosoever doesn't deny himself, that is bowing himself down. Carry the cross. 
follow Jesus. Anyone who doesn't do this one cannot be my disciple. Cannot go into the most holy at all. The first thing you need to go to the holy means you need to do all these things. Sir. That is what uh, complete consecration to do Lord's will. So as soon as we consecrate and dedicate our life complete to the Lord, you see what happens? We come to the holy place. And this holy place is a very, very grand thing to see because entire thing is gold. And the only light inside uh, that one is from the golden candlestick. Imagine you are in the complete room made out of gold. All the walls, everything is gold. And this light uh, that is uh, there, how glittering, how bright it will be, dear brethren. How glorious that uh, light is there. So similarly, consecration brings beautiful results. Uh, it brings us a lot of enlightenment. Uh, that is what represented by the candlestick and the bread. You see, without the candlestick, you could not never see the bread. Uh, so what does this represent, sir? The golden candlestick, it was trimmed morning and evening. The priest used to pour oil inside it. So what does oil represent in the Bible? What is the meaning of oil in the Bible? Can anybody tell me? Meaning of oil in the Bible. Holy Spirit. Very good, sir. Holy Spirit. You see? In olden days, the priest was anointed with the holy oil. Kings were anointed with the oil. So that represents the Holy Spirit. So without the Holy Spirit, you see, you can't understand the Bible. And if you have more Holy Spirit only, you can understand more of the Bible. So how do we get the Holy Spirit? It's not so easy. It has to be trimmed. All the dirt has to be taken out daily. Morning, evening, continuously you need to take out all the filthiness in your flesh. Then only the pure character in us will develop. Then only God gives us more Holy Spirit of understanding. Or else how can we understand the Bible? You see? So opposite to this one, there is the table of the shoe bread. We all know Jesus clearly said when he was tempted by the devil that a man shall not live by bread alone. Matthew 4.4 4. But by every word that proceeded from God's mouth. You see, that means the word of God. The bread in the Bible represents the word of God. So six and six means 66 books of the Bible. If you need to understand the 66 books of the Bible, Holy Spirit is required. Without Holy Spirit, you see, nobody can understand the Bible. Therefore, if you see, so many Christians are there in the world. Eh? Do they know the Bible? Nothing they know. Why? No Holy Spirit. They think they're jumping, laughing, crying. You see, all these things are Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, when it comes, it gives us understanding. Uh -huh. So, how do we read the Bible? The first class. Hear a little, hear a little. So, so, scriptures. You see, so, this is all possible with the Holy Spirit. Okay. So, if you see, uh, again, uh, in between these two, and very close to the second veil was the incense altar. You know, morning and evening, whenever the priest used to come to trim the candlestick, he used to take a handful of incense and put it on the golden incense altar. And that, you see, that incense used to give out a, a beautiful, you see, pleasing aroma. This is to go beyond the second veil into the most holy. This was very pleasing to the Lord. So what are this represents? As God gives us more of the Holy Spirit uh, and as we get more of the understanding of the Bible, dear brethren, daily will be tested. You see, daily our faith, our character, everything will be tested. How? A handful of it will be put on the incense altar. We will be put to fire. We will be made to sit on the fire. Sometimes uh, the trials will be very severe. That's what we think. But it is only handful. Remember, God doesn't give so much of trials uh, in a day. Sufficient for the day, the evil thereof. Jesus said. So each and every day we have trials uh, from morning till evening. But in all these things, how are we trying to prove ourselves to God? How are we showing ourselves to God? Are we demonstrating the Christ-likeness? 
or else uh, are we, you see, uh, walking away from God? Dear brethren, how is our character? Does it reflect Christ's likeness or what? That is what the incense. If our sacrifice is pleasing to God, if it brings us good character and good name, that is a pleasing and a very good incense to God. Let us read 1 Peter 4.12. 1 Peter 4.12, brother. Huh? 1 Peter 4.12. Gopal, brother, can you read? Yeah, brother. 1 Peter 4.12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange things happened unto you. Hmm. Think it not strange concerning the fiery trials. Fire. The trials itself is a fire. Don't think stranger. These are all things that has happened for a Christian, for a consecrated. What does the Bible say in James 1.12? This is the man, you see, that ended with temptation. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. When he is passed, what will happen? He will get the crown of life. Read, brother, James 1.12. James 1.12. Joel, brother, can you read? James 1.12. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which is the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Ah, promise to him that love him. So we will receive the crown of life, dear brethren. You see, so those trials are necessary. How did Jesus pass these trials? Ephesians 5 2. Can somebody read Ephesians 5 2? Ephesians 5 2. Sunita Star, can you read Ephesians 5 2? And walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. Sweet smelling incense. Jesus' walk was like that. Are we behaving like that, dear brethren? Day by day, each and every trial. Does it really manifest a Christ likeness? Then only it is pleasing to God. You know, huh? this incense had to pass beyond the second veil. Then only the high priest could go beyond the second veil. Or else if he goes just like that, you know, even he would receive death penalty. So what does this represent? Our life should be pleasing to God now itself in this Life, then only we can pass beyond the second well. Now, only if we don't show character, we can't even imagine to go to that place, the brethren. So, then only we can enter the most holy. So, most holy, what was there? God's Shekinah glory was there. That represents God's character, God's presence. So, if we need to enter, you see, God's character, hmm, what we should do? There were three things inside the you see, the Ark of the Covenant. You see, the first thing is a golden manna. Huh? Golden, see, in the golden pot, there was a manna, an orange butter rod, and there was a tablets where ten covenants is given. See, outside, the manna is to get rot. But here, the manna is to never get rot. There, the orange butter rod was there. You see, it was uh, uh, budded and also with fruits, flowers, everything. And the golden tablets. Uh, so what does this represent? Uh, the manna outside got corrupted. But the manna, if it enters the most holy, it would never rot. This represents the divine nature which the Lord has promised us. John 6, 49 to 51, Jesus said, I am the living bread, I am the living manna. If any man eats me, he would never die. See, this is the manna which God has promised us, the immortal nature. Then the orange butter trot. You see, there was a lot of competition for a priesthood. You see, they fought together. Why are you only? Uh, we are also called to be priest. And God told, okay, bring everybody on, uh, you see, uh, almond, uh, you see, uh, rod. Keep it inside the tabernacle. We'll see whose rod is buttered in the morning 
they will be the prishta. But you know, next day if you see, Aaron's rod was not only budded, it gave fruits as well. That itself was a clear proof that he was a chosen priesthood. Now what does this represent? This represents the brain that we are God's chosen priesthood. Read 1 Peter 2.9. 1 Peter 2.9. Uh, Romy's sister, can you read 1 Peter 2.9? Mr. Can you read 1 Peter 2 9? Um, yes, brother. Hmm. But ye are the chosen generation and the loyal priesthood and holy nation are um, a peculiar no, no. people um, that ye should show forth the praise for him. Who mm. had called you out of darkness mm. into his marvelous light. Very good. Sir. So you are a chosen priesthood. You see, so we are a chosen priesthood, dear brethren. So that represents the priesthood. And the third was the law, the Ten Commandments. Now, Ten Commandments actually signify the law. Now, today, who studies the law? It is the judges. That means. The church along with Christ are going to be judges. So these three things represent the duties the church is going to do with Christ when they are beyond the veil. First thing, there will be kings in the divine nature. The second thing, there will be royal priesthood. The third thing, they will be judges. Judges, priests and king. Read Revelation chapter 20 verse 6. Revelation chapter 20, verse 6. Munaster, can you read? Revelation 26. Blessed and holy is he, he that hath part in the first resurrection, and such the second death hath no power, for they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and, and shall uh, reign with uh, him a thousand years. Thank you, sir. See, they shall be kings and priests. Uh, and reign with him, rule. So, this is the work that the Christ is going to do with the church. Now, there was a mercy seat upon this, uh, you see, Arka. Now, what does that represent? Sir? That represents uh, the oneness of uh, church. Uh, and, uh, you see, you see here, see the oneness of the church and Christ. You see, who is head of the church? Uh, Jesus Christ. So, that shows the oneness. And it also signifies God's character. So all these things we are going to see detail in the higher classes. So dear brethren, so here in the most holy, always uh, God's presence was there. So God willing, if we are faithful, we will be going to God's presence. That's what all these uh, things in the tabernacle are uh, uh, significance here. So any doubts, any questions, anybody has, they can ask. Uh, I'll be sharing this uh, YouTube link as well as the PDF. Anybody has got any questions, they can ask and clarify it. Anybody, any questions?